seen this before, where uh, the, the congregation fills up first, and then the, the good seats <laughs> fill up last. And usually it's the other way around. I hope I'm loud enough for all, all you folks over there. My name is Jack Miller. My wife in the black um, blouse is Tooney. Uh, neither of those names are um, our real names. We, we don't want anybody to know them. <laughs> But we go by Jack and Tooney, and um, we're from Punta Gorda. We live in Punta Gorda right now. There's a little blurb in the bulletin there you can read about us. Um, we come from um, St. Louis, where our daughter lives, and uh, they are, they're, they're safe and everything, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the water there just destroyed a lot of that town. Mm. And um, it's just a devastating, uh, the loss of people a lot of people are going through with these uh, storms. So if I don't say it, somebody yell out and remind uh, me that we will uh, keep those folks in our prayers when we get to the prayers. Um, this is the first time I've seen it. I've only seen it for about five, 10 minutes. And uh, so if I make a mistake, just yell out and say, hey, not there, go here instead. <laughs> and we'll try to follow this, uh, this sheet. Um, there's sermon notes. Are you used to sermon notes? Are you used to that? No? Okay. Uh, well, let's see. Turn to the bullet. You have bulletins, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Let's see which page it's on. Here. Yeah, it's on the inside uh, right page. And it's right in the middle. There's five of them, and they're filled in the blank kind of things. I don't know if you have pencils or not, but if not, you're going to just have to rely on your memory. And um, it's not, it's not <coughs> rocket science by any means, but it's just kind of a way uh, to form a uh, outline to, to follow along what we're going to cover in the bulletin. And just one last thing. I love this. It's the first time I've ever been like this before. Usually we were, was either in a gown or um, a suit jacket, but I got permission from somebody over there that said it was okay to be like this. That's a lot cooler down here in Florida like this. And there are, the other thing is, I don't know who's in charge of design of clerical clothing, but they make everything out of polyester. <laughs> polyester is like wearing a raincoat in the church. <laughs> you know, that's I, so I, I, hope, I hope you're not offended, but I, I certainly like this part. Yeah, let me get back to that page. Oh yeah, uh, one other thing. Would anybody like to read the um, first two lessons? Okay, I'll give you the long one because you volunteered. <laughs> oh, actually, it's in there too. It's also printed for you in the bulletin, but um, it's pretty small. Yeah. So um, this was in bigger print. I'll, I'll give you both of these, and then you can give them back to me, and then I'll read the gospel lesson. Should I read the first one? First one, and if there's anybody else, that's fine. Otherwise, I could read whatever's left over. I'll take the other. Who said, okay, all right, good. Mm -hmm. Not yet, but uh, <coughs> just the first one for you. Okay, I'm going to get my page back. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, let's uh, sing our first uh, first song. And it is 362, the first and the fourth verse. 362, the first and the fourth verse. <laughs>
our sins. Let us confess our sins to God, our Maker and our Rescue. Almighty God, merciful Father, I am troubled and sorrowful sinner. Confess to you all my sins. I have offended you. I justly deserve your punishment and harm forever. But I am sorry for my sins and turn away from them. I pray for your boundless mercy, for the sake of the suffering and death. Your Son, Jesus, be gracious to me. Please forgive. Give to me your Holy Spirit to change my sinful life and bring me to life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us. For Jesus' sake, he forgives us all our sins. Through his Holy Spirit, he cleanses us and gives us power to proclaim the mighty deeds of God who called us out of darkness into the splendor of his light. As a called and ordained minister of Christ's church and by his authority, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You can be seated and we uh, hear the Old Testament. Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him things in heaven and things on earth 
In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the second chapter of Luke, um, verses 40 through 52. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why, are you tr why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. We confess our faith in God as we say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Several years ago, um, well, first of all, um, how many of you have direct TV or dish TV or uh, cable TV? Yeah, well, pretty much all of you. Uh, there's, I don't know, what, 300 possibilities that you can watch? 300 stations, 200 stations maybe? We have uh, maybe 200 on our package and we watch eight of them. <laughs> Maybe you have a similar kind of uh, ratio. Uh, and uh, when there's nothing on the eight, then this happened uh, a couple of years ago. I started uh, surfing, you know, looking for something to watch. And um, I came across and paused on this uh, program. It was, um, I don't even know if it's still on anymore, but it's, are you smarter than a fifth grader? Yeah. Some of you have seen it. Okay, good. I think the, po uh, the program concept is really kind of cool. And after some of the questions that I listened to, uh, I'm sure that those questions can be very intimidating as well. Now, I did well in fifth grade. And, uh, but the, the, matter, the fact is, uh, I've slept a lot since then. <laughs> I've had a lot of meals. 
And the old uh, gray matter isn't as good as it used to be, and my memory isn't nearly uh, what I want it to be. The contestant on this particular program that evening was a pastor or a priest. I couldn't tell which, and he didn't say, but he had a clerical shirt on, just like I do right now. So mostly um, uh, liturgical um, church clergy are, um, are in clericals. You know. So it'll be Lutheran or a Catholic priest or a, an Episcopal priest, usually. Not many others use that. So I assumed he was uh, uh, one of those three. And if he was a Lutheran, I thought, well, he should do very well because uh, ministers, at least in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, usually have quite a few years of study under their belt. And, um, well, uh, like in our Missouri Synod, to be a pastor in the Missouri Synod, you have to have four years of college, at a college or a university, it's got to be an accredited college. And then after that, you have to go through four years of seminary at one of the two seminaries. We have a seminary in St. Louis and one in um, Fort Wayne, Indiana. And that's the bottom line. That's, that's what you have to start out with. Most pastors have a lot more education uh, in different fields than that. Uh, Pastor Galke has his bachelor's degree from Concordia College in Brocksville, New York. I have my uh, undergraduate degree from the University of, uh, uh, from, um, <laughs> I should really know where I went to school, <laughs> but it was Northwestern University in Chicago. And we both graduated from St. Louis, Concordia St. Louis, with our Master of Divinities degrees. But again, that's the minimum for pastors in our church. Uh, they, they have to have at least that. And again, there's much more uh, as well. Anyway, um, as I watched that program, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? None of that education helped. <laughs> I'm sad to say. <laughs> and it got me thinking. How smart are people? And really, how smart are you? And I thought maybe I'd test that this evening. In the first sermon note, and it's in the, you know, that uh, inside front page, and you can follow along if you want. I'm going to uh, ask you to answer that um, sermon note. And uh, I'm not going to give you the answer until the end of the message. But here's sermon note number one. And this is the very same question that was on TV uh, several years ago. In an isosceles triangle, what is the length of the third side of the triangle if the first two sides are five inches and eight inches respectively? Is it what, it's gonna be one of these. Is it 13 inches? Is it five inches? Or is it three inches? Now, circle your answer, don't show your <laughs> paper to anybody else. <laughs> and don't lean over and look at anybody else's paper. <laughs> okay, why did I bring this up? A fifth grader is usually 10 or 11 years old, and in about the fifth or sixth grade, I, I, it used to be this, I don't know if this has changed, it seems like kids grow up a lot faster today, but it used to be this. In about fifth or sixth grade, Kids go through a development stage in their thinking, in their ability to think. Up until about fifth grade, kids think concretely. Uh, they, they deal with concrete uh, um, issues. Two and two is four, that's concrete. Somewhere in the fifth to sixth grade um, passage of time, their thinking develops so to the point where they can start dealing with abstract concepts. Uh, what's an abstract concept? Uh, why did the chicken cross the road? You know, that, that's abstract. In our church, uh, I don't know how it is here, but um, in the churches I served, we, we, had, we didn't start the confirmation class until kids were either in the seventh or eighth grade. And that's because Confirmation is just loaded with all kinds of abstract concepts. And if you start too much earlier than that, uh, the kids have a very difficult time dealing with them, uh, or, or understanding them even, because they're, you know, that, that, that spurt from, uh, from concrete to abstract thinking hasn't taken place. Um, 
in the ancient uh, Jewish community. 12 years old was the age when youth began their advanced instruction in the Jewish religion, and that's when they started participating on a, really on a, an adult level in the worship service of the church and, and, and uh, um, in the worship festivals of the Jewish uh, religion. I don't think much has changed there. I think that's still about that age group where uh, Jewish kids go through the um, bar mitzvah. You've heard of that. That's, it's not the equivalent because um, they teach different things. But it, I, I mean, at the same time of year, for the same person, uh, for the same reason, um, the Jewish church and the Lutheran church begin teaching the basic doctrinal positions and uh, doctrines of the church. So in that case, you know, in that sense, it's uh, very, very similar and very, uh, very uh, similar in age groups as well. In our gospel lesson today, Jesus is 12 years old, just slightly older than a fifth grader. And we find him in the temple. That's where his parents found him as well. He tells his mother that he has to be in his father's house. Twelve years earlier, when he was born, Jesus was in the temple. He was with Mary and Joseph, as you um, would expect. And at that time, when he was just an infant, he was presented, dedicated to God, circumcised, and officially named. And at that time, he was identified by Simeon and Anna, two old timers, two senior citizens who spent a lot of their time in the temple. He was identified by them as the chosen one of God sent by him to be a light of revelation for the Gentiles and to the glory of the people Israel. He was sent to redeem the world. And here's sermon note number two. And uh, this, these here, the rest of these are going to require you to fill in the blanks. At 12, Jesus is re-identified as the promised Messiah in the person of God's own son. So that's sermon note number two. And if you, you, want, if you're, if you want these uh, later and you don't, didn't get them now, then just let me know. I'll, I'll give them back to you. By the way, now this account of Jesus when he's 12 years old is only found in the Gospel of St. Luke. It's not in Mark or Matthew or John. It's only here in Luke. And if you have a red-letter edition of the Bible, and if, if there's anybody here that doesn't know what a red-letter edition is, a uh, red-letter edition is where the words of Jesus are printed in red. So if you have one of those Bibles, you will, and you can track the beginning of Luke up until this uh, second chapter here, then you'll see some words written in red. Because this is the first time we have <coughs> Jesus speaking in the Bible. Luke chapter 2. Um, this, uh, this in speaking in the Bible here in Luke chapter 2 is also the uh, only words that we have from Jesus between the time he was born and the time that he begins his public ministry 30 years later. This is the only time that he speaks, right here in our gospel lesson today. The last verse of the text here in uh, Luke chapter 2, this verse sums it all up, all these 30 years that, um, that are essentially, um, uh, essentially mute. We don't hear anything about Jesus for the first 30 years of his life. We don't hear any words from his mouth. But uh, these, this last verse, it sums it up. Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and, heart and stature and in favor with God and men. But back to when he was 12. Jesus and his parents made the customary journey to observe the Passover to Jerusalem. Now this trip gives us a glance ahead to Jesus' later entrance into the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, when he would again be in his father's house but the final time, this time, to accomplish his work as the Savior. Traveling to Jerusalem for the celebration 
was festive. Usually families and friends, they traveled together. It was, uh, in Nazareth, I, I want to say it was probably 60, 70 miles. Maybe, it's, maybe it was a little further away than that uh, from Jerusalem. So it was uh, like a two or three day trip. Usually friends and families traveled together and they went in large groups um, for the uh, camaraderie and for the visiting, but also for protection as well. The women and the children walked ahead and the men brought up the rear and they would catch up with the women and children uh, at the end of the day when they were in the place where they were going to lodge for the evening, you know, where they were going to sleep. And here's uh, sermon note number three. And this is kind of important here because you, you wonder how Jesus can get, uh, how could he get lost? But Jesus being 12 was at the age where he could walk with either the women and the other children or with the men. He could walk with either group. Now, there weren't any problems on the trip going to Jerusalem, but returning from Jerusalem was a different matter. Both parents assumed that Jesus was with the other parent. Joseph thought he was with Mary and the other kids and the other uh, women. And Mary thought the same. She thought that Jesus was with Joseph. And so they walked a whole day like that, some 20 or 30 miles. Um, they were going north uh, from Jerusalem to back to their home in Nazareth. It was a day's journey. Now put yourself in Mary's place. Um, well, Mary and Joseph's place. My guess is that most parents have experienced that home alone syndrome, that frantic anxious time when you have a similar experience when you couldn't find your child. I know we, we've, we've had one or two of those experiences with all of our kids. And um, they're anxious hours until you find out what's, what's going on, you know, anxious hours. Go well, back to Mary and Joseph. They journeyed one day north, 20 or 30 miles, one hour you can walk in a day. And then the second day, they journeyed back to Jerusalem. So that's two days. And the third day, they find <coughs> Jesus in the temple. Now, here's uh, sermon note number four. You can certainly sense the anxiety combined with the feelings of relief and irritation as Mary asks, Son, why have you treated us so? And that just feel right? I mean, wouldn't you feel that way if that was your son that you didn't see for three days? <clears throat> it certainly is an understandable question from a mother who loves her son and is focused on the parent-child relationship that she and Joseph had with Jesus. And at the same time, Mary may have been astonished by Jesus' apparent lack of concern for the ordeal that she and Joseph had endured for the last three days. I'm also sure that she was amazed at the boldness of a mere boy engaging the teachers of the law. He came to them as a pupil, hearing them and asking questions, but he also assumed the role of teacher, amazing them with his understanding and his answers. Here's the last sermon note. The... Uh, rulers of the temple and Jesus, they were talking theology. They were talking about God and his will for man. They were talking about sin and the damage that sin does to the, to the humanity's relationship with God. They were talking about mankind's inability to fix the situation and talking about God's word or what God's word said he would do to reconcile the world to himself. They talked about the Messiah and his work. And perhaps Jesus even suggested that the Messiah was about to make his entrance onto history's stage. They talked about life, eternity, and how God would save man because man, mankind cannot save itself. They talked about complicated 
and important matters. Jesus is very wise. And you know what else? This 12-year-old boy certainly knew the length of the third side of the isosceles triangle. He certainly is smarter than a fifth grader. Look at your answer sheet. If you circled five inches, then you got the answer right. An isosceles triangle has two equal sides. It also has two equal angles in, in that uh, particular triangle. But more importantly, and this is, most, is the most important thing for you, uh, for you to possibly know. You, you know this. You know this. And it is the ultimate thing to know. If you believe in your heart and confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and Savior, then you have the ultimate answer. You have eternal life. Jesus died to take away your sins. And he, spent, or he sent his spirit to create saving faith in your hearts. Someone taught you that. Not all fifth graders know that. Less than half of them in the United States don't know that. I'm sorry, more than half of them don't know that in the United States if the statistics are true. And far fewer, far, far fewer in the rest of the world know that. That's something that we have to teach them. And not just fifth graders. We have to teach all children about Jesus so that the Holy Spirit has something to work with when he tries to create faith in their hearts. It would seem that we have our work cut out for us. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now, um, I'm not sure, do you collect a, an offering? You don't? Okay. I like that. What's <laughs> up? All right, well then, um, I'll get back to my sheet here. Huh? Um, prayers. Would any of you like me to mention anybody in the prayers of the church? Yes. Anybody else? Okay, we're going to remember the folks in the uh, yeah, the, the middle part of the state, especially St. Louis, but uh, there's other areas that were flooded too. Uh, anybody that's suffered as a result of this, uh, what do they call it? Uh, Act of God. Anybody else? Yeah. No, people in Tornado Alley that have had a number of tornadoes too. Okay. Tornado Alley. Especially in the southeast. Yeah. I, I'll mention that the gentleman uh, on the list, his name is Ed Nussbaum. Uh, he passed from the hospice on Friday this past Friday. Mm -hmm. Comment about hospice says the greatest thing since sliced yes. bread. It's really a nice, uh, nice organization. Anybody else? Okay, let's stand for prayer.